Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Look, today, I, uh, you know, we talk a whole lot about this pandemic. We know what's happening in the field. But you know who are the only people that really understand what's going on? Those are our registered nurses. Those are our janitors who are taking care of the floors and making sure things are clean. Those are the doctors that are in the first place taking care of those to make sure we are all healthy. I saw Dennis Kasath. I hope I said that right. That's uh, fine. Great. I saw him on MSNBC, and he was relaying the story about what was happening at his hospital, his hospital being uh, Provident Hospital in Chicago. Uh, welcome aboard, Dennis Kasath. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm a little, it's a little bittersweet, actually, because tomorrow is going to be my last day at Provident. They are cutting the budget. They're reducing staff, and so tomorrow's be my last doing my last shift. They're Provident. I've been a nurse for for 13 years. I've been in the county system, which is the public health safety net system in in Cook County in Chicago for uh, I don't know 11 11 of those years, and for the last three I've been at Provident. So it's a little sad to a little sad for me tomorrow. Okay, I tell you what, I want to get into that part of the discussion because I think that yeah. is going to ultimately be the most important part about it. Uh, but what I want to do, first of all, is for you to tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me a little sure. bit about who is Dennis. We want to know who are these people that are always out there on the front line that risk their lives, as a lot of us play patty pay with wearing masks and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, I've been, um, I've been a nurse for about 13 years. Uh, it's, it was a second career for me in the sense I've worked in other, basically other kind of odd jobs. But a while ago, I worked as a nursing assistant. And I really loved that work. I was able to take care of people, make a difference in people's lives. I really loved it. It was working for a state um, system in Wisconsin for people with developmental dis disabilities. Uh, the downside of the job, though, is that the pay was just terrible. And that was one thing that I learned in this thing is that when you take care of humans, that is not valued in our society. I think I was making like, this is in 1998 or so, I was making maybe $6 and 20 some cents an hour taking care of human beings. And then I did that for, for some months, maybe five or six months. And it was, the work was really hard in the sense that I worked the night shift, but they were so short staffed, they would force me to work the day. So I'd be up all night and they're like, oh, you're gonna work another eight hours from seven until three. And after a few days of doing that, I was like, look, I gotta, I can't do this anymore. And I went over to UPS and I was making $2 more an hour stepping on boxes. And so that to me was like a, one of the first lessons I learned in how healthcare is delivered in this country and how it's, uh, it's about money and it's not about what people need. And so then I did, I did work at UPS for a number of years and that, then I left that and became a nurse and I've been doing that for the last 13 years. Well, I mean, I, great. I saw an interview that you gave, uh, actually a very passionate interview that you gave on MSNBC, uh, just asking people to mask up, asking people to do what's necessary and right. uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I really wanted to talk to you is th that you said something that is dear to my heart. And that is, here you are a registered nurse, but you know that there are times that you have to go on the line outside to protest and say, you know what, right. we, need to be, we need to take care of human beings better. And not only that, but we also need to make sure that uh, we have the resources that are out there. That's right. The job done. So tell me a little bit about how is, what's the state of... Uh, the, the pandemic in, in your vicinity, in your part of uh, Chicago? Yeah. I mean, in Chicago, it, it's really awful. Um, the, the positivity rate is very high. The death rate has been very high. Um, it's, it's, it's rough for, for people who work in hostels right now. Like I constantly talk to coworkers who are short staffed, like they don't have enough beds. They don't have enough ICU rooms. They don't have enough uh, med surge beds to hold the patients and, and they're really sick. And the thing is, is that coronavirus has shown a spotlight. It's, it's like a stress test. I mean, people know what stress tests are. If you have like chest pain, you want to go into the, you want to go to the doctor, they figure out, they say, what we're going to do is we'll walk, we'll walk in a treadmill. We're going to see, we're going to stress your heart out and see if it still works the way it's supposed to be working. So coronavirus is a stress test happening in our health system and it's exposed how broken our health system and in particular how broken it is for, for BIPOC people, for people of color, for African-Americans in Chicago. I mean, they make up about 30% of the population, but they are 70%, 60 to 70% of deaths. Latinx people, Latino and Latina uh, people make up about the same, about 30% of Chicago's population, but it's double that when it comes to positivity rates. And it's, it's wrecking havoc upon our communities of color 
and, and it's exposing decades old healthcare inequities that have existed in the city for so long. Chicago actually has one of the worst gaps in life expectancy in the entire country. Uh, Englewood, which is on the near south side of Chicago, the average life expectancy there uh, is 60. It's predominantly African-American. It's a poor neighborhood, just eight miles away up in Streeterville, very rich, very white neighborhood, 90. This richest, the third largest city in the, in the richest country of humanity has a 30 year life gap. And this was before coronavirus. And so that's, we're seeing the devastating impact of this coronavirus on a system which has not cared for, for people who work for a living and especially not cared for people of color in this country for very long. You know what is so interesting is I've been on a thread today with a few of my, uh, a few of us that write at another, I write at several other blogs other than my own as well. And we had this conversation about uh, the coronavirus and its impact on society. And one of the things that they were saying is, oh, this is all wrong. If we calculate the death rates and all of that, it's not all that bad. And I'm like, let me ask you something. And not only that, they're, they're against, well, uh, all these restrictions, it's really not fair. And, they're, and, and the masking, it, you know, these are, and these are not right wingers I'm talking about. These okay. are moderate guys that write for fairly liberal rag. Right. Okay. Right. And I, you know, I go out there and I say, so tell me, are the, are the portable freezers that I'm seeing in El Paso yeah. uh, a figment of my imagination? No. Nope. Uh, the thing about it is, <laughs> We understand that there's a whole lot the plutocracy does to make more money on health. We understand that. Yep. And this, and they, it could be that uh, what the conspiracy that these uh, many on the left are pushing is, uh, okay, well, you know, maybe it is that just the plutocracy wants to make a lot of money. So that's the reason why they're making this more than it is. You are there. Why right. don't you enlighten these people about the difference between what you are seeing at your hospital and what's really was before? The people who are being affected are, are like you were saying, these are people who work in nursing homes. These are people who don't have health insurance. There was a guy who I took care of who tested positive coronavirus. He was a security guard in a hospital. He worked full time in a hospital. He had to work, but he didn't have any health insurance. He has to work there six months in order before he can get health care. Like, how does this make sense? And everybody who comes to Providence on Chicago South Side. 99% of our patients are, are African American. So that's the population that we're, that we're working with. These people work for a living. They contribute to society in all kinds of ways. Are the essential workers that are being held up saying, oh, look, these people who work in grocery stores, who work in transport, who, who drive buses, who are postal workers. Those are the people who come into the hospital I work at who are being exposed to this disease. And because of their underlying conditions are having worse outcomes. Now, racists would say, oh, well, people who have high blood pressure or maybe they have asthma or diabetes is because of their genetics. And that's just garbage. We know that that's patently false. It has nothing to do with genetics. It's, those are diseases of being in a lower socioeconomic status. If you live next to a highway, you're gonna have more likely to have asthma. If your grocery stores, your neighborhood, all these sell are potato chips and, 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 and hot wings, are you're gonna have more likely to be obese. You're more likely to have diabetes. Um, so it's about access to quality food. It's about access to quality healthcare. Uh, and if you don't have access to quality healthcare, you're not gonna be able to get the kind of healthcare you need. You're not gonna be able to manage your blood pressure, your diabetes. I see so many patients come into the ER. They share insulin with family members because they can't afford it. They take their blood pressure medicine every other day because they don't have enough of it. So this, this is definitely, having a horrible effect on people who are already suffering, who are already uh, suffering from the health inequities and the social justice inequities that exist in our society. The lack of empathy is, is pathetic as I see it right now, because what, what people don't realize, and you just stated it there, these are the people that we depend on. When we, when we go to the grocery store, masked <laughs> or unmasked, we want right. to see them there. When we yeah. want to get to that bus, we want to see them there. When we want that cup of coffee, we want to see them there. Yep. Now, here, here's an interesting thing. You're at a hospital, a security guard who works at the hospital gets sick. And you say, wait a minute, how comes he's at working at a hospital and can't get care? Well, many right. times the hospital in order to, 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 to give credence, more credence to the point that you made where you stated that uh, it's not about health care. These hospitals who are providing a service to make a profit off of your illness, they will go hire security guards from companies that don't provide yep. their people uh, health care instead of hiring it from the hospital itself where they're required to provide yep. health care to their full-time employees. You got what it. What gives? It, it just doesn't. I mean, this individual, he, he didn't work at the hospital I worked at, but he worked at a big chain, mm -hmm. uh, a, a big Catholic chain. And he 
worked like you exactly like you said through it was contracted through a company and they had very terrible benefits and that's so many people and that's why this disease is ravaging across this country because our working conditions are awful when people are sick they go to work they go to work because they don't have sick pay i also work in schools as a nurse and so many parents will send their kids to school when the kids are sick they'll be vomiting they'll have fevers and i am so understanding of why they do that because they have no choice because if they don't, if they don't send their kid to school, they don't go to work. And if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. I mean, this is an outrageous that we live in the richest country of the world, and people have these working conditions which make no sense and are actually bad for public health. It makes it worse. But the people who control our society, who run our society, the decision makers, they're not affected by it. They don't. They probably don't even care about the effect that this thing is happening because they're such racist, because they're the ones who are at the top of society who've been benefiting from this, the way that things have been operating for so long. And that's why I think what you said earlier about us all masking is absolutely important. Like, and, and to go beyond that, like we need to do more than that. We can, we can play a role in making our world better, just regular working people, just like you and me. We can, we can work together, organize and, and demand something better. We need to. I think it's so important. You know, it, it's funny because there's a meme that's been going around on, on the internet recently talking about AOC. AOC is evil. AOC is, and I'm, I'm talking about these folks that are, that, you know, they are so bad because they want to do good to humanity. In other words, they're so bad because I want to give you health care. They're so bad because I want to make sure that there's health, there's, there's uh, care for your kids for you to go to work. They're so bad because they want to make sure that the air that you breathe is, is worth breathing. Right. You know, when, where, when did we become such a society that have allowed a few to tell us that we are not worthy of having right. good things for us all? When I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think this, goes back, this goes back to the foundation of this country, in my opinion. This country, what was it founded on? Stolen land. And people slavery. came from somewhere else. They murdered the people who lived here, either consciously or you know, uh, by accident through spreading diseases, et cetera, stole their land, murdered them, chased them down like animals and killed them. And then they brought other people from another continent in chains and had them work that land. So that is the foundation of this country. And so we have to understand the, the, what's happening today. I think obviously that was a very long time ago, but I think some of those ideals, some of those ways of thinking that these are, that people are just you are used, can be used by us, by, by, by a small percentage of people at the top, to profit from and that there's there should be no kind of common good there should be no kind of uh, 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 sense that we depend on each other that it's very deep in this country unfortunately and those ideas are, are put forward continuously by the mainstream media by politicians who like allowed themselves like Donald Trump oh I'm some kind of self-made person that's garbage he was handed millions of dollars by his father and was a terrible business person on top of that so this idea that he's some self-made individual is just garbage but it, we're kind of all fed that that line that if you just work hard enough and struggle hard enough and may, and just get, get ahead, you will survive and succeed. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you rather than something wrong with a society which doesn't put those values at the core, which is that we should work towards each other. We should help each other. We should all benefit from the wealth that we all create. And that's to me a, a, a big problem that has to change in our country. When I saw that interview that they gave to you on MSNBC, this is the reason that I wanted you on because, you know, I can sit down behind a mic and be on a camera and I go out in the field sometimes to see things. But this coming from somebody who's actually doing the work, who's actually seeing the debts, who's actually seeing all of this, it means that much more to our audience. Because what happens is there are a lot of talkers out there, a whole lot. Okay. But there are very few people that are uh, that are doing the real work out there to make things better for everybody else. Now, earlier you said that um, your hospital, they're downgrading or tell me a little bit about that. It's an outrage. And, and this is a safety net hospital. And we all know what safety net means. If you're a trapeze artist or work in a circus, if you don't have a safety net, what do you have? You have concrete. Right. That's it. You're, you're, it's not, that's you not a good situation. So this is a safety net hospital. It's funded by taxpayers money. And the, the politicians, and again, these are Democratic parties. I'm not a Republican. I'm also not a Democrat. I think both parties have a lot of problems. Um, and the Democratic Party who runs Chicago is cutting the budget. They unanimously, they unanimously voted to cut the budget of Cook County uh, Health and Hospital System. They're closing two clinics, which provide uh, primary care uh, on the side of, south side of Chicago, and they're reducing the ER to be a standby ER. So our ER typically would have five, six nurses on the day shift. Now they're gonna have three. 
And that what standby means is they can have a doc. They don't have to have a doctor on board. They don't have to have an X-ray technician on board. They don't have to have a phlebotomist, you know, someone who draws blood or or lab people to to do tests on blood. They don't have to have any of those things. And they're doing it on the south side of Chicago in the middle of a pandemic that's disproportionately killing African Americans. It makes it makes it's just an outrage. I want to stop you a second. I, I want to be clear, and I want the audience to be clear about this. There are several county hospitals around Chicago. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I mean, well, Cook County is a system, a healthcare system, and it has Stroger, which is the big flagship. Provident is part of that. It used to have Oak Forest Hospital, and Oak Forest over years was starve, 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 and then it died. And Provident, it's the same thing. And, and the thing that's unfortunate about Provident, it's the first African American owned and operated hospital in the history of the country. This doctor uh, was who founded it did the first open heart surgery when someone was wounded. He fixed that person's heart. And so there is a legacy to this hospital that is being disrespected, in my opinion, by the cuts that have been happening. And they've been slowly bleeding Provident for many years. They took away the deliveries. They've, they've reduced the number of surgeries they'll do. They have taken away the ICU. And so they built this wall and they've dammed up any kind of influx of patients into that hospital. And now they're standing back and look and say, oh, it's not being used. I guess we have to cut it more. It's just so outrageous that they're the ones who created the situation to lower the number of patients. And now that there's less patients, they're using it as an excuse to cut it further. And ironically, they're they're cutting it when uh, you are understaffed for a <laughs> pandemic. Even if even if they wanted to make that argument, the right. fact that you have a pandemic right now dictates that you at least wait till the pandemic is yeah. over before you actually have some other uh, other other thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and then what they say is our hands are tied. They say we don't have a budget, and it's true they don't have a budget. But it get back, it gets back to how healthcare is organized in our society overall. This is the richest country in the world, and we spend more per capita on healthcare than any other country in the world, and have some of the worst outcomes. In particular, for African Americans, African American women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. African American babies are twice as likely to die. Uh, during during following delivery. African-American men are 40% more likely to die from colon cancer than their white counterparts. So we pay more and we get less and some of us get even less than less. And so it has been an outrage for many years and that's their excuse they're using. So we need to have more money come into public health systems and we need to change how public, how healthcare is organized. So it has to be around meeting people's needs, not about what makes money. The only healthcare system that makes sense is a single payer Medicare for all when there's where there's no profit motive for you providing care to the, the cost to, to the patient. Otherwise, uh, there will always be a for profit reason for doing something and that uh, that that the, uh, that the average American citizen has been hoodwinked into believing something else is at best suspect at worst evil. The thing that's interesting is that there was a poll done, uh, exit poll, to my understanding, with this latest presidential election, 72% of Americans, of voters, support a, diff a, a, a healthcare system where everyone's covered. This is Democrats, this is Republicans, across the board, support it. The, the issue in my hand is you have politicians who have zero backbone or zero will to take on the large health insurance companies, the big hospital chains, and big pharma, the big pharmaceutical companies. They don't want to take, they don't want to touch them because they feed them. Right. They feed them the money that allows them to run their campaigns, so they don't want to talk about national health care. Very, there's very few politicians who have the, the, the backbone or the guts to do that, unfortunately. Two more questions. The first one is, what can we do to, uh, to help this situation? The audience that we're talking of, uh, yeah. we, we have a, both a progressive and a conservative audience. Okay. I mean, I think that some of the basic health uh, care safety things are things that we need to do. Wear a mask keep safe distances, uh, wash your hands. Those are the things that we all can do. We don't, but I mean, the thing that I'm thinking about is a lot of times these nurses, uh, nurses are held up as heroes. And, 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 you know, maybe becoming a nurse is something that someone has to think to do to be able to fight this disease. You don't have to be a nurse. You don't have to go to school for two years. You don't have to be, be real dealing with blood and vomit and all, all this stuff, all the, the body fluids to, to do your part. We can all do our part. Wear a mask, keep safe distances, uh, wash your hands. Those are the things, when you get sick, seek medical help. I think those are some baseline things that we all can do. Secondly, we need to advocate for ourselves as patients. We're all patients. We're all people who need healthcare. We're all people who require health. There needs to be a higher level of public health knowledge, meaning that we should support having more nurses in schools who are part of educating uh, young people about 
what public health means about basic things that we can do to keep ourselves safe, but we also need a better system that centers patients' needs over making money. When you, everyone can advocate for that. Call your representative, go, organize with your, with your neighbors, uh, talk to people in your workplace about fighting for a better kind of healthcare system that our country deserves. Okay, Dennis, what, didn't, what did, didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? I mean, you covered a lot of things. I think you covered a lot of things and I really appreciate it. I think that uh, I really appreciate your, your questions. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate your interest, your audience interest in this topic. Well, look, Dennis, it's been my pleasure to speak to you. I wish we had more spokespeople as good as you are on this particular issue because that is what it's going to take. America needs to and America needs people who understand the issues and who can put it into a form that they can understand. So thank you so kindly for having been. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was I was just going to say I think I think you make you make an important point, but there's also nothing special about me. There's nothing special about me. The history of this country is regular people like ourselves who have stood up for something and made it right. Slavery was ended because regular people stood up and ended slavery. Slaves stood up, abolitionists stood up, enslaved people stood up. The, the right of women to vote did not happen because it was handed down from high. Regular people stood up and fought for that. Gay marriage was won because people stood up, regular people stood up and fought for those things. We can make this world better. We can make this country better. Just regular people like, like us. We just have to, we have, we have to educate ourselves, learn the issues and organize. We can make it happen. Dennis Kosov, you don't know, it's been my pleasure to have you on Politics Done Right. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anytime. Thank you. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.